and welcome to the Effective Design for Science webinar hosted by Lisa B. Marshall. Lisa B. Marshall is a communication expert who delivers consulting and workshops. Is an author, is the author of best-selling books, Smart Talk, and Ace Your Interview, and is the host of the uh, public speaker and the Smart Talk podcast. The podcasts are quite popular and have earned over 15 million downloads. Lisa's clients include John Hopkins. Uh, Medicine, Manager Investment Group, Genentech, Roche, Harvard University, and others. She's being featured in CBS Money Watch, Radio.com, Cosmopolitan, and more. One last thing, if during the webinar you have any questions, please use the comments and questions sections on your screen. At the end of the, of the presentation, Lisa will answer all your questions. So, let's get started. Now I'll turn it over to Lisa. Hey everyone, I want to ask my first question here. What happens to your attention during a presentation? So you're just settling in, just like now, the speaker is introduced, and you suddenly start to improve your attention. Oh, the presentation just started. But then the mind vacations begin. You start thinking, oh, that reminds me. I've got to go back to the lab. I've got to call John when I get back to the office. So why does that happen? Usually it's because of bad delivery, unclear organization, and very poorly designed slides. And to me, that's the trifecta of terrible talks. And so what's the real? And on and on, the speaker drones on. And then what happens? That is until we hear the two magic words. In conclusion, now unfortunately this isn't too far from the truth and as I mentioned the trifecta of terrible talks, the bad delivery, the unclear organization and poorly designed slides. Today I'm only going to have a short time with you so I only have time to cover the delivery and organization. I cover those in, in I mean I won't have time to cover the delivery and the organization. I cover those in other seminars but today what we'll talk about is slide design and of course I even in an hour don't have time to do that fully I, this is based today's presentation is based on a much longer uh, presentation that I do to cover all the details of slide design but today we'll cover at least some tips and techniques hopefully to help you significantly improve your slides so I want to cover the primary rules to help you to create clearer co more concise and more compelling slides so to do that I thought I might start with what not to do, as opposed what to do. And so in order to discover that, I wanted to share with you a survey from my colleague Dave Party. He does a survey every two years, and in that survey, survey he talks to organizations and institutions, academic institutions, and he tries to determine what annoys people the most about presentations. In fact, he calls it the annoying PowerPoint survey. And so in the handouts, by the way, I gave you the full results, but today what I'd like to cover is just the top five presentation annoyances. An interesting note is that the last two years, the last three years actually, the top three annoyances have been the same year after year after year. So the problems still persist, even with people like myself trying to persuade people otherwise. And by the way, again, in your handouts, you do have those details. So let's start with the first one. Coming in at number one is reading the slide aloud. And by far, that is the most annoying, annoying thing that a presenter can do. And I think it happens really for two reasons. The first reason, and I, I have to admit that I've been guilty of this myself, is that sometimes people put the text on the slide because they need it as their notes. They, they don't want to forget what they're going to say, so they put it up on the slide. And then the second reason um, happens more in business situations than I see in academic or, or organizations, that they use the slide deck as the document, as a report. This is the way they share information in the organization with or without the presenter. And so a lot of text and details are added into the slides. So we don't have time today to cover the second solution, but I do want to talk about the first one, which is using the, 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 the text as your notes. So here is an example of a typical slide that's been submitted to me um, in other seminars that I've done and you can see this is probably something you've seen before something that's that's familiar to you and there's a lot of text in there and interestingly when I looked at the details of this when I looked in the notes it actually said read slide so I think that most people realize that you shouldn't be reading the slides 
So how do you avoid reading the slides? What can you do to, to not read them? And so I, my main suggestion, of course, is to put the notes that you want to speak into the notes section and instead simplify what it is that you have up on the slide. Now this is my first recommendation. At a minimum, you should at least simplify. And if you notice in this one, I also have some highlighted text. The reason why you need to do that is because when you have something that's heavy in text like this one, you look on above, of course it's behind that speak and don't read, but it's so heavy with text, people aren't going to read that. They're not going to spend the time. They're either going to be able to listen to you or they're going to read one of the two. And so if you want to get people to pay attention quickly, it helps to put these highlighted text. Um, if you go even further, you could take the text off completely, put the text in the notes section. Of course, you're going to put it in presenter view so you can see your notes while you're presenting and just have a little bit of text. And in fact, I would even go far as saying even having a text slide or a graphic slide without any text at all. Particularly in the beginning of a presentation when you're doing that background information, if you are talking about that background information, many times it's something that can be done purely with graphics alone. Now some people might be saying, yeah, but that, <laughs> we don't do it that way. Here's why I recommend this. If you look at the multimedia research, what they talk about is this concept of the redundancy principle. And the redundancy principle says that when we have redundant material, it interferes with learning. That makes sense. And if you think of it this way, while you're speaking and you've got text on this screen, you've got redundant material. So when they go through the research, it turns out that people learn more deeply when the learner only is hearing narration verbally and seeing a graph. And so that's why I was suggesting that slide before, simply a graph with the verbal narration. Now, of course, in science, some people say, well, no, 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 <laughs> you need to have some text on there. So there are a couple of exceptions that the research suggests. And one of the exceptions is when there's enough time to process the graphic and the text is very limited. And in fact, you may be thinking, well, Lisa, on your slide, you have text on your slide right now. <laughs> yes, that's right, you caught me. But this, in essence, is one of these limitations, the one I'm talking about now, where there's just a graphic on the slide. It's very easy to understand the graphic or to see the graphic, and there's very limited text. Now, it also has an exception when you just have very limited text and no graphic at all. So just a couple of words on the screen. That works as well. And then the final one is when the audio is difficult to understand. And so for some people, for example, I'm sure there's many people here that are second language speakers. When you're a second language speaker and you're, or you're speaking in a second language, often the accent um, is difficult for the audience to understand. So in that case, the suggestion is to put additional text, particularly on the first couple of slides, so that the audience can hear and see the text or see the words at the same time and hear how you're pronouncing those words. And of course, if there's just poor sound quality altogether, you're also going to need text on the screen so people can see. So although there's three exceptions, it really is important to think about how you can reduce down the amount of text that you have within the slides. So what's number two? Full sentences. So again, I think full sentences come into play more so when we see those living documents when people are trying to use the PowerPoint as a document versus a presentation itself. But you also see it in presentations like this. I'm sure you've seen something very similar to this. So you want to just shorten up as much as you can. Short phrases, get rid of any redundancies. And you can see here I've shortened it considerably. I've, in fact, took away the hypothesis altogether. I'll go back to the one that's the bad one again. And you see I've just shortened it, and I use bulleted points, and I use short phrases in order to make it clearer. Now, it could be where you're presenting them together. You could talk about it in a build. You could do that first section and then the second section as well. The idea, again, is to shorten and to make it as, as phrase-oriented as possible and as quick as possible when you've had um, a lot of text. So what's the next thing on the survey? Too small, too small to read, the text. And so again, this is primarily due to these presentations or, or documents, I'll call them uh, slide docs, basically, that they're being used as a document. But again, even I see presentations, I see an academic presentation fonts that are just way too small. And in fact, um, you can see even on this one, now this is pretty big, I'm going to show, show you the one that I changed here, but on the original one, it's really, really small, right? See how small that text is? And now I go back to this change, and then in this one, I made it even bigger. And I believe that the biggest possible fonts that you can use with some consistency, you can't have a huge font and then a small font and then a huge font, but the biggest font that you can use consistently across the screen is the way you want to go, as large and as plain as you can go. 
What comes in next? Color choices. So in this case, we have poor color choices. And usually poor color choices, um, when it comes to science, is usually not necessarily in the backgrounds and the foregrounds, but it has to do more with the, the colors that are used to identify um, within. So let's just talk about foregrounds and backgrounds. A lot of people ask me, well, is the, the slide, are you supposed to use a dark text on a light background or supposed to be light text on a dark background? Is it supposed to be a certain color? What's the best way to do it? And it turns out that when they did the research, they did the research, it was difficult to actually come up with a specific recommendation because there's too much variability in terms of the room sizes and the type of projector that was used and a lot of different variables. But they did determine that light text on a dark background or dark text on a light background or equally work well in a small room. In those very, very large conference rooms, you know, I'm sure you've been to those very large conference events, they say that excuse me, that the light background, or I mean the light text on a dark background is in fact more clear. But I think you need to be thinking about when you're taking into consideration your background, you also need to consider the science. If you have a lot of fluorescence, then you're probably going to want to do a dark background. If you're doing a lot of graphs that have white backgrounds, you probably want to stick with the white background. And it's okay, by the way, within science that if occasionally you need to switch the background the, the color of the background for a particular slide, that's okay, but keep in mind you only want to do that background change because it's going to be noticed when it's an important slide. If it's something that you want the audience to kind of perk up and pay attention to, it's okay to do that switch if necessary and if it makes sense to do that. Now thinking about color in this one, high contrast, that's what we talked about. In this one what we see is some doodads or something scribbles, graphics in the background. You can't have any sort of graphic in the background, particularly on, on title slides, but it really in any of the slides because it is very distracting. So you want to make sure you just have a clear background. This is the redo of this one. Clearly this is a lot easier to see. You also want to consider the psychology. So when you're considering psychology, you want to think about, well, red, of course, is going to indicate um, things like that it's bad or that it's a problem. And you want to think about green being positive and um, and being uh, uh, money oriented. You want to think about yellow being caution and blue being from a psychological perspective being um, professional and clinical. And these all have these, again there's meanings for all the colors, but for now just know that there is meaning. Of course you already naturally know that, that there's meaning associated with that. You need to think about that and take that in consideration when you're using your color choices on the slides. And in this case, you can see there was some color choice used. He used negative crosstalk and positive crosstalk. He uses the colors to emphasize the point that he's trying to make. In addition, he also uses the bullet points below to also highlight what those differences are. This one, although it's a quite complicated slide, when this was presented, um, it was presented in pieces. This is just the very, very, very final slide. But I wanted you to see that in this one, the colors were also chosen. And you can see that there's plus and minus marks on both the red and the green, again, showing that psychological connection. One thing you need to consider is there is uh, a very common red-green color blindness. So if you're creating a slides that have red and green in them, then you need to take that into consideration. In this case, if this were a colorblind person, they would not be able to distinguish between those dots. So what we need to do is consider changing those dots, oops, changing those dots from dots to X's so that they could see the difference. Again, considering the science in here, when you do a slide, you're going to want to try to make sure that it's very clear that you can see um, the slide differences or the color differences, particularly in these when you want to have somebody's eyes photo adjust. You want to switch that dark background and make it clear which colors are indicated. Again, the same here. We can see that the colors are more clear and oriented. And then finally, we come to the last complaint, the last annoyance of PowerPoint, and that's that overly complex diagrams. And so I want to break down diagrams. We're going to be talking the rest of the time about diagrams, but in particular, let's talk about some simple things that can be done in order to, in order to address complex slides. So this is a typical slide that you might see. I'm sure you've seen something very similar to this in the past. And this may have been presented as a build, meaning that pieces of it might have been presented and then another piece may have been presented, but eventually the whole slide comes up. But I don't think so. I'm pretty sure I remember this one being the entire slide all at once. And I also seem to recall that some of the pieces of this were not 
being presented at the time and the person said to me well I just wanted to go on there just in case somebody was interested or just in case somebody wanted to know and so I think it's important to think about in this case you need to think about less is more you're used to the information you've seen it when you're having pr a presentation people are seeing it with fresh eyes and they need to focus in and see something as efficiently as possible and so in order to do that we need to break down the slide into smaller segments and also consider um, some other aspects we want to have what's called minimum essential data and what do I mean by that by minimum essential data it's in essence it's in essence the way that you make the chart as simple as you can in fact it reminds me of the Einstein quote everything should be made as simple as possible but not simpler and so that's what we're shooting for here we only want to make one point per slide and remember that the paper is different from your presentation the paper is where you're going to contain all of the information the paper's goal is to contain be the repository of the data the, the goal of your presentation is simply to, to stimulate discussion or get people interested if they want to get the details they can get more of those details from the paper so it's important to consider that as a difference so that you understand that it's okay to remove some of those details and the audience is different right when you're presenting in a paper it could be anyone <laughs> but when you're presenting for um, a presentation you have some sense of who's in the audience and that will help you to determine what you can keep in or take out of the presentation so again just as a review here's what some the, the preview the before and here's my after slide and you can see in the after slide it's been reduced considerably it's just the two elements that they were going to present with the main idea you can see that the title slide is or the title of the slide has up to two lines and you can see that the font choice is larger than the font choice for the bottom takeaway and you can see that they're labeled and identified where it is that we're supposed to be looking again the idea is to make it as quick as possible for your audience to know where to look or what to what the main idea is and that main idea is contained in those first two lines across the top in case that mind vacation goes on in case the person hasn't paid attention they come back they can look at those first two lines and say oh okay I see this is what they're trying to communicate at this point in time so let's look at the process how would you look at how would you look at your own slides and think about making changes so let's say this is your slide this is your before slide and if we look at this we need to think about a couple steps in the process and the first step in the process is to prune and so again when I talked to this person he said well I'm really only going to only going to present four of the panels I'm going to present panel A and E and panel D and H the other panels were just extra ones that I had as part of my data and um, it's a couple of the the, uh, the elements were elements that were pointing for another report that I was doing but I just left them on there so you need to clean all that stuff up and notice also he's got the logo at the bottom right you want to remove the logos the logo should be on your title slide and potentially on your last slide but the logo slides don't need to be plastered all over every slide um, and then look at the reference the reference he's got there is the full reference really you only need the shortened reference as long as you've got the full references at the very end of the presentation so those are the things that we're pruning and condensing so that would be our first step so we pruned and condensed and we came down to this we have the shortened reference we took off the took off the logo we cut cut out all of that extraneous artifacts that were part of the images and we made it cleared up so we can see just the two panels now the next step is to think about well what are the additions how do we make this thing clearer I'm going to go back to it again just so you can see it without that thing slapped on top so what do we need to do to make this thing clearer where do we need to look where do the eyes need to focus and what is the main point that we're trying to communicate and is that main point part of the title and in this case the guy's main point was not that skeletal defects were found in, in the polycomb protein mutants that was really his evidence what his main point was that was that is silencing the silencing was important in mammals that the polycomb protein silencing was important in mammals and so we needed to change that title first of all we needed to circle and point where those those the skeletal defects were so that we could easily see them between the two panels focusing our eyes and move our assertion which is at the top is silencing in polycomb proteins important in mammals and then the evidence skeletal defects is found in the polycomb, polycomb protein mutants and so what we're seeing here again is the assertion at the top in the form of a question and by the way you can put 
assertions either in the form of a question or you could simply put it in the form of a statement. You could say silencing is important in mammals. It really depends on what it is that you're trying to communicate at the time. Is it important that your audience understands the question? Is it important that the audience understands that this is the question that you ask? If so, you might want to put it in the form of a question. And also questions are more, uh, more conversational. If you ask a question, people are more naturally likely to start thinking of a response. So sometimes putting it in the form of the question is more effective. Okay, so now let's talk about more about the slide design and what we can do with that to make slide design effective. And I like to talk about what's called a billboard design. I think we can learn a lot from billboards because billboards really in effect are the same goal that you have for your presentation, particularly with science slides. That you want the person to be able to look at it quickly and understand it, but then return their focus back. In case of, of the billboard, of course, return back to driving. And in your case, you want to return the focus back to you. And so what can we think about um, in terms of, or what can we learn from these billboard designs? We can actually learn quite a bit. If we look at the first thing, what we can see is we have the headline title. Remember, the title communicating the main meaning, which is what we saw just before. And we also see the takeaway. In the top right-hand corner, we see this, the, this, the evidence uh, point. We have, so we have our assertion on the left, and we have some evidence on the right. And in this case, we can also see that the eyes are being guided to important stuff. Previously, we saw that with circles and arrows, but in this case, they did it in an interesting, creative way. They had the crumpled up, um, the crumpled up sign there, the crumpled up car and truck. So it's guiding our eyes to the important parts. You can see we have a mix of image and text. Having a mix of image and text is particularly important. There's research again um, from Mayer in 2009 showing that when we want to learn something, we always need the mix of the image and the text. And particularly, the image needs to be strong images because we can process images. We can process images in our mind far faster. It's about 30,000 times faster, believe it or not, than we can any sort of text. And from a complex standpoint, or from a, a science standpoint, Understanding complex information, we can understand it differently and faster when it's in the form of a graph, obviously. Um, it's also processed in a different portion of the brain. It makes us, um, the text is usually processed in our short-term memory, whereas the graphics are conceptual, so they're usually processed in our long-term memory. They go directly there. So you're going to get the benefits of, of having a strong graph on every slide when you're presenting in a variety of ways, even from pure, simple brain science. What else do you need to consider? You can see that high contrast of color. Of course, we see the light, the dark writing on the light background. We also see the use of color, the red bright color. That's on purpose, so that that stands out against that background. And we also see that it's using a sans serif font. So a sans serif font is simply the font that doesn't have the little hang downs. I've heard some people call them doohickeys. I don't think that's the right name for them, but the little piece that hangs off. If you're in a room right now and you look around to your exit signs, any exit sign is going to be in a sans serif font. Anything that you see on the road as you're driving home um, this evening, you'll want to look and see. Any signs are also in a sans serif font, and that's because sans serif fonts are designed to be read from a distance. And so you're going to create your all your PowerPoints using a sans serif font. I'll get to the details of that in a few moments as well about which sans serif font. And then we get to the structure, right? Again, we see we want to have this assertion evidence structure. Assertion at the top, in terms of a sentence, a sentence form that says the main idea that you want the person to understand, and then we have the visual evidence underneath. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, it turns out that Ali, he's from the Pittsburgh, uh, University of Pittsburgh in 2007 did some work looking at how um, the structure, what structure would be most effective for learning purposes. And if we look, we see that in science this would look similar to this, right? The rest of a protein translation is suggested by blah, 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 and then we have our visual evidence below. Now, what did he find? He found a couple of interesting results that the assertion evidence structure led to much stronger recall and also better understanding, particularly in the comprehension of complex data. And that was actually a more recent work that he did. That was in uh, 2013. And he also found that when you use this structure, people have fewer major misconceptions. Again, much, much fewer <laughs> misconceptions, particularly in the more complex data. What else did he find? For those of you that also teach in the classroom, students that use this structure 
think and learn more deeply about the particular topic when they use this particular structure. It helps them to, to sort of summarize and conceptualize the ideas more effectively. And so this assertion evidence structure is clearly one that you're going to want to use. Now there are a couple of slight variations that I'm sure you've seen, but we'll think about that as we go through the next couple of examples. So how do you, how do you begin thinking about your slide? So most people start with their visual evidence and then they add a title on later. I would like to suggest that you flip that on its head and start opposite. Um, you'll see things like this. You typically, I'm sure you've seen this in slides. This is usually more in academic settings, and of course, this is the, the exception. It's not very often, but you still see this sometimes. You see titles like this. That's something like results 104, and then the next one's results 204, and, and it's too common. So it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't give any meaning. So some people do a little better. They give you something like this, which is more like a descriptive title: photo of a mouse with helmet, which again is a little better but still not what we're getting to when we're talking about a headline or an assertion title. So again descriptive titles don't really communicate anything. Instead you need to think about what that main point is and you need to put it again in that in that heading. Why? Because the person may not make the same conclusion that you're drawing from the data. So in this case the conclusion may be never give up or maybe it's helmet saves lives. Or maybe it's really this, success equals creativity plus determination. So the idea is that in these, in these assertions, in these headline titles, you want to express the so what, not the what. And that's really critically important. And I can tell you from working with private clients and working with, with organizations for over 20 years that this one change, if you were just to go back through your slides, and see what your titling is. I bet, in fact, right now you could go back and look at a slide that's on your desktop and find slides that do not follow the structure. If you could just change this one major, just one change, that would make a major significant difference in the understanding of your work. So I recommend going back and doing that. So start with your blank slate and think about what you want the audience to remember and then go from there. So then let's now look at an example, yet another example. Here's something that was uh, submitted to me before, and it says experimental design, right? So we see experimental design, we see a process going from top to bottom on the left-hand side, and then we see some of the points here, we see some visual evidence, and what we want to do is we want to think about what's the so what? What is the so what? And does that title really help us? Well, experimental design, again, is descriptive. The so what really in this case is that skin conductance equals the skin moisture. And so we're going to move that around. We're going to put that into the, into the heading. Arousal was measured via skin conductance, moisture. And then what we're going to do, we're going to choose the best visual evidence. And in this case, that best visual evidence was that graphic there. And so again, simplify main meaning across the top, simply the best graphic that you've got to make that point. Let's look at a few more examples. In this case, this was a more complicated. They needed to, to make a couple of assertions First, they wanted to talk about um, one piece and then they wanted to have a second piece. So let's look at how this is. So sometimes you need to really discuss what it is that you are asking before you get to the assertion. Why do you need to do that? Because sometimes what you're discussing is controversial and so you don't want to go directly to the assertion because people will just immediately put up their guard. Sometimes something that you're discussing needs more explanation because it may be unfamiliar territory and so sometimes you need to do those questions first and then not not the question that I said before, the you know the assertion in the form of a question, but but just the question that you are asking in terms of the science in order to lead the person through. So let's take a better look at this. So this would be the first step. Again, this is in the form of a build. The first question that they were asking was here: How do you neutralize? How or sorry, how do neutral stimulus come to symbolize threats? And so they're just asking the question that we wanted to talk about. Well, how did we think about this? And they go through that process, of course, and step through. So. That's the question that led to your assertion. Now you want to you want to think about this. I think about this really in the the form of the scientific process. So it's going to be here a question and then your evidence and then your assertion. It's kind of sort of the backwards format of what we talked about for before. Again, here what leads to motor neuron degeneration in Smart One? That's your question. Here's the evidence and then at the bottom we have the assertion. Again, you still have the assertion evidence structure in the sense that you have 
the um, that you have the assertion on the slide, but it's just moved into a different format um, so that you can better accommodate that particular audience or the needs of that audience or the needs even of the work that you have or that you're presenting. Sometimes even the question is so important that you need to separate the question onto a separate slide in and of itself so that you can aid the understanding of the audience. Particularly with, with basic science, sometimes it's difficult to follow along to know what it is that the questions you're trying to address and how those questions relate to each other. So sometimes in that sort of presentation, having a separate question slide is really far, far more effective. <clears throat> <laughs> Obviously, in this one, I'm recommending that you don't use figure text. Figure text often is the description or, or information of, of course, what the, what the figure is, and that information has to be simplified down and put into the heading. So you never want to put figure text on a particular slide. You want to, again, show the, the takeaway. What is the, what is the evidence here, and what is the result or the conclusion that you're drawing from that? Now what I'd like to do is to, to go through a bunch of just basic rules, basic formatting rules, and these are things that you may or may not be familiar with, but just simple rules that are important to know in order to follow. I can tell you that these are mistakes that I see commonly. And so the first question that, that is, is that, and we talked about it before, what's the best font? I already said a sans serif font, and if you notice at the top, the Georgia and the Times Roman, those are, are examples of the serif fonts. So you can see the little edges on those. So you don't want to use any of the serif fonts, and you don't want to use the, the uh, sans serif font, the Comic Sans way at the bottom there. That's just a silly font that people um, have, have, um, don't like. Don't like. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you want to pick the best serif font. So, or sorry, the best sans serif font. So the best one, in my opinion, is Calibri. Now, why do I pick Calibri? Because first of all, it's a standard on both Mac and PC, number one. And more importantly, if you look at it, Calibri allows you to pretty much pack in the text. If you notice, it's one of the most compact on there. And when you have information that you're presenting, often in science, of course, you know you've got longer words, you've got longer text, usually you need two-line titles. So you're going to want to have as much con con um, ability for, for, to make it condense as possible. So that's why Calibri. <coughs> Excuse me. You want to think about not using all capitals. Why is that? Because when you have the difference between the tops and the bottoms of, of the words, when you have small small letters and capital letters, it's far more easy to read. When you have all caps, it just makes it diff very difficult. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to mix your font types. If you notice on this one, it has a, a serif font at the top and then a sans serif font down. You'll notice the titling in court trick or the, the serif font, and then we have the sans serif for the rest. Um, if you're doing work that's, say, for example, for a, a, a book or if you're doing something for web design, that is the recommend, recommendation. But when you're doing it for presentations, it's always the recommendation to stick to a single font. You don't want to have that variety. You want to think about the proper, the proper case for your titling. A lot of people try to use different forms of titles. I mean, back, back in the days of the typewriter, right, we had to, to show what the difference between the title and the rest of the text was, and we really didn't have much choice but to sort of use random capitalization, you know, that old rule, you know, which big, big words get a capital and small words don't. You know, you don't follow that rule anymore. What you need to do is just follow the regular sentence case, and sentence case is what it would appear. You just capitalize the first word in the sentence and all the rest are smalls across. Uh, you'll see that example right there. You want to make sure that you're using initial caps when you do your bullets. You'll see here, I see regularly where people don't do in the initial caps. It's just a standard rule. You want to make sure that you use standard bullets. You don't want to have anything that's distracting for the eye. And so anything that's not a standard bullet, that's not adding to the meaning, you want to make sure that you don't use that as well. You want to make sure that you reduce any repetition. You don't want to have excess words. That's sort of part of the phrasing that we talked about in the beginning, but it's also just sort of a, a standard formatting rule. You need to think about layout. This was a, a slide that was given to me. It's much more difficult to read when you're going um, down the slide. You can see that titling says hit mouse, uninvolved, vessels 20, blah, blah, blah. Right? That should have been going across the slide like this so you can read much more clearly. Okay, so let's talk about, again, minimum essential graphs, some more examples of what that means. The term of this minimum essential graphs actually came from Jean-Luc Dumont. He's um, a guy that's the, the principal at Principe, and he gave this example of a bad graph. And so what he's applying here are basically the rules 
um, rules of graph design. Um, there's lots of people that have written about the best ways to present data, you know, the, the, the most effective ways to present data. And this is just sort of simple things to think about in terms of graphing. And so what he wants you to do is to think about having your data lines separated. If you notice here, it's very difficult to see the difference between the measured and the calculated. And in fact, you have to sort of do mental gymnastic, gym, gymnastics to sort of look, oh, the plus sign is the measured, oh, the minus is the calculated. You want to make sure that any of your non-data lines are not, um, not prominent. So you're going to make those in a gray or some sort of light color. You want to make sure always that your position labels are near the data. Again, you don't want that gymnastic. I'm going to show the bad one again. It's kind of hard to see through there. And then that your relevant tick marks are the only tick marks that are on there. That's one I have sort of a quibble with. Um, that is the rule, but you'll see at times that I don't think that it works as effectively. So let's look at the example here. This is his fixed slide. You see to the left I put, kept the bad one so you could kind of look over. You can see that he has changed. The, the lines, he's changed them to colors and dots. It's much easier to see the difference. He's done the labeling much closer. He's removed any of the irrelevant tick marks, and he's relabeled and made it more effective and clean. So that is the cleaned up, and again, according to the rules of minimal essential design. Here are the elements that he added in to clear, clarify. Now, we talked about builds before, and I just want to talk about that because a lot of people ask me about animation. They say, well, you know, do you need to use animation? So there's two sort of parts of animation. One part of animation is uh, building, which is bringing in the data, bringing in pieces of a, of a, of a graph or gra gra part of a presentation, or I should say presentation, part of a slide. But there's also animation in the sense of some people have things that roll or turn or twist or kind of graphically come in from slide, come into the slide. So that sort of animation, things that are just um, moving for moving purposes, that's an absolute no-no. You never want to use that sort of animation. The only time you want something moving on your slide is if it adds again to the meaning. So if you're showing something maybe with cell migration and it's important to see how this is migrating across or something that you're, it's important to what you're presenting, then yes, you can go ahead and use that sort of, of animation. But what I'm talking about here is just um, it builds for build purposes, meaning that you want to, you've got a very complex idea, you want to still start with your foundation point and then move on from there. So here's an example that was given to me, a person that I work with, and he said, here are the points that I want to make. I want to say that each of the protein complexes, PRC2 and PRC1, are made up of distinct subunits. I also want to say that all the subunits are required in each complex and that the most important point, and this is the main idea, that silencing requires both complexes, right? That silencing is important in, man, in mammals. That was really his main idea. And so how do we get to that? So when we looked at the slide, I said to him, and this was a slide that was towards the beginning of his presentation. So we need to think about at this point in the presentation, and you'll be thinking the same question to yourself, at this point in the presentation, what does the audience need to know in order to understand this particular point? So you need to remove any data that's not going to be helping you at this point in time. So some of the details here weren't important because, again, he was just trying to simply show that silencing was important in mammals. Now, we also need to think about color choices. We talked about color before. Look at this one. We see a color on the left and colors on the right that are very similar in color. Now, I'm sure that, because I've done this so many times in front of audiences, I'm sure that if I asked you how many people thought there was some relationship between the stuff on the left and the stuff on the right, that there would be a good portion of you, not, not more than half, but at least 40% of you would be raising your hand saying, yes, I see, I, I would assume there's some relationship between the two. And it turns out that, in fact, there isn't a relationship between the two. And the way that the, the author of this told me that there wasn't a relationship, he said, oh, well, Lisa, look, there's the ones on the left are circles, and the ones on the right are cylinders. So, of course, they're not related. And that wasn't immediately obvious to me, and, and I'm sure not immediately obvious to some people looking at it. So we need to be um, looking to an intelligent other, somebody that can look at us, look at your slides and help you to think about it from their fresh eyes, from their perspective. So here's what we did with the redo. Let's look at the redo. So of course we changed the title and we wanted to put that to be the most important point, the silencing is important in mammals. And then we broke it up. We simplified the diagrams because again, at that particular point in the presentation, the, the, the details really weren't important. What he wanted to talk about was that the multiple subunits were distinct in each of PRC1 and PRC2. We showed that with the graph. And then we said all the subunits are required. It was a team effort. 
And then finally, both of the complexes, PRC1 and PRC2, were required for silencing. Now, I guarantee that this, what we just did here, was far more clear, more, far more concise than what we saw previously. The idea is to, again, simple as it needs to be, but not so simple that you're dumbing it down. Simplify so that the audience can see it very clearly and quickly so that you can then get the audience attention back to you for you to continue talking about what the slide is. Often we use builds when it comes to um, comes to uh, the, this type of, of presentation, this type of, of slide. When we see uh, when we see a pathway, pathways often when we're presenting them, we're highlighting just a certain portion of the pathway. And so, I, although the whole pathway needs to be on the slide, of course, because we need to understand from a, from the perspective. But often what we need to do is to break it down into a build in order to force the audience to focus in on just the sections that are important. And just as a side note, notice this person also was using the green and the red, the coloring to talk about and to indicate some of the aspects of the slide. And so when we redid this one, we simplified it down just to talk about the section that we talked about. And again, often pathway slides, we have the concept of a switch, something being on and off. And so we showed here, you know, when it's on, this is what's happening. And then when it's off, this is what's happening. And then we have the final um, understanding at the bottom there. So again, clarify, you can still have it on, but you want to, you can still have the whole entire pathway on the slide, but you want to have it so that it's focused and organized so that the person is only looking at the section that you want them to be looking at at the time of your talk. Again, this is the final point here. You also want to use builds when you're describing a process. This is one that was given as an example. We can go through and see the process here step by step, walking through the process, and that is an effective build. Notice also, by the way, that this built in a clockwise direction, and you're going to want to do that as well. People tend to tend to work in that direction. Also here, if we look at this particular build, we see that this build was somebody that wanted to show graphs, multiple graphs at the same time. So this person was stepping through the data. This was a, a recent one from uh, one of my, my uh, medical clients, a doctor um, who's a head of a, a nonprofit foundation. Anyway, she was presenting this data. She wanted to present this particular chart. And then she wanted to talk about this particular other additional related chart. Now notice these are, again, related charts, but the axes, the X and the Y, are different. When you have different X and Y axes, but they're related charts that you want to put together on the same slide, they should go up and down from each other, one on top of the other. If, however, you have two slides that are related slides that have the same axes, X and Y axes, then you want to put them left to right. And the reason why you want to do that is because your eyes can more easily adjust, and it doesn't take um, you could do the, uh, the comparisons much more easily when you've got them side by side, left to right. In this case, again, it made more sense to do them um, one on top of the other because they were different. And again, you can see this is her final slide. This is the final bit that she's got here. So it works through um, what her differences were. A build showing each of the pieces and then she could see here's the first part, here's the second part, and then our final piece. Okay, so now we see this particular one. We saw um, part of this presentation before, and I talked about the process being on the left-hand side. We see, we see that process going down. We see that we're in that one section of the process, that anxiety there. So if you think about processes, our mind usually processes those from left to right. So you're going to want to put that in the left to right sequence. So instead of what we just saw there, we're going to move it across the top, as you can see, and then highlight the section that we're in. Now sometimes when you're doing data, especially when you're doing clinical types of data, usually you've got long surveys, you're doing a lot to collection, you want to talk about the different variables and the things that you collected, but usually there's only you know, a certain portion or certain variables that were the important ones that you wanted to focus on or certain questions in terms of a survey in this case. So what you're going to want to do is to go ahead and expand that into a call out. I'll show you without the little thing on there. So you can say, you can talk about, well, in general, this is a survey that we did. We asked about a number of questions. And some of the important questions that we asked about were this. Or if you had, again, you know, a large number of variables, we looked at all, considered all these. But really, when it came down to it, these are the ones that we were focusing on. So you're going to want to do those callouts to highlight and show what it is that's important. You don't want to include verbal transitions. You only want to include <laughs> the transitions um, when you're transitioning from point to point. You're going to want to do those purely on the verbal basis. You can see on this one on the bottom, this, this was clearly what they were planning to say. How can we improve on the analysis? That just doesn't need to be on the slide. 
okay, I know you're probably getting tired, but here's more rules to follow for slides. And so these rules are going to be rules for things that we encounter, that all of us encounter in terms of our uh, presentations that we make. So all of us have title slides. And so when we think about this title slide, one of the things we need to first think about is the actual heading itself, or the title itself. So in this, in the title, um, where are the natural breaks? If you think of this one, it says multi-scale dispersal patterns of triatinoma infestations. Right? It doesn't make sense that it's there. If we were to take a break, it's either multi-scale dispersal patterns or multi-scale dispersal patterns of tri triatoma infestations. So there is these natural breaks that we have in terms of our language, and those need to be taken into consideration when we're developing the title. But we also need to take into consideration the audience um, and also the, the area of study. Some areas of study um, take the exact title from the papers and they use those for their titles of their presentations. But more often, you're going to see shorter titles, more, more um, understandable titles, more less detailed titles when we come to the presentation itself. So we want to simplify. It doesn't have to be the paper title. In most cases, it's not the paper title. Usually, it's something much more simplified. You also want to make sure that whoever the presenter is is very clear. Sometimes the presenter um, is just mixed in there. We're not sure. Sometimes somebody takes over. Maybe it's not the first author who is the presenter. So you want to make sure it's absolutely clear that we know who is presenting this particular presentation. And notice on this one, too, it's kind of covered over there. I don't know if you can see it on the next one. Let me see. Well, you can see it underneath. The date is there. You need to be careful about the date. Some people like to put the date on because they think that it makes it fresh, but some people will make a mistake and leave an old date on there, and then, of course, you're making a bad impression. And really, if you think about it, the date really is for your benefit. Usually, a lot of time, you're putting that date on just so that you remember when you presented it. And really, presentations should be audience-focused and not you-focused, and so really, that date should come off. So here's the redo. You can see it's been done considerably less multi-scale dispersal patterns. And then we have the person's name who's presenting. And then we have the affiliation in there. Much more clear, much more clean type of titling. And again, I mean, not that you want to make a great, you know, huge, great impression on your first slide. But the first slide needs to be something that, that, that at least doesn't go, ugh. <laughs> the persons don't go, oh, gosh. Right? You want to make it be at least a, a, a neutral or positive presentation or positive feeling when you see that first slide. Now the next slide that you might see within a presentation after you've gone through the background information, or maybe even sooner than that, you might see what's called the outline slide. A lot of people refer to it as the outline slide. I do not like that term. I prefer to call it a preview map. The reason is because often when people refer to it as an outline slide, what they're really outlining is things like background, and then I'm going to talk about the data, and then I'm going to talk about the conclusions. Now, of course, that's really, <laughs> really outlined and really generic. But sometimes it's really, it can be as, that, as bad as that. Um, it, can be, um, it can be as bad as that because the people aren't really thinking about um, what they're presenting. So what you want to think about is how can you um, preview the main ideas that you're in your presentation. So what I suggest is to, to create the title. What you want to think about is, to create the title, what you want to think about is take your main conclusion, whatever the overall main conclusion is, and often it's a form of your title um, that you had to begin with, your actual presentation title, and move that to the title of the slide, um, the title of this particular slide, your preview map slide. You also want to think about um, simplifying these pieces down to the point where it's for this particular audience. So. Most presentations that you're making, of course, are to what I call sort of a, a middle ground science audience. They may not be experts in your particular area, but they're probably something closely related. So in that case, you're going to want to give some information. You probably can give them pretty close to your conclusions, but you may not be able to give them all the details of your conclusion. But if you're in an audience where you really are in your subspecialty, maybe one of those smaller type of conferences, then when you're delivering that, you're going to have these this preview really give a lot of your full conclusions right here at the start of the presentation. And this also, this preview map also serves as a guideline for the structure of your talk. And in this case, you can see, even though we may not know anything about this, we can just know that how they added the enzymatic function to the de novo proteins while they did the analysis of the structure, then they created the active site, and then they stabilized the design. We can all understand that. 
then even if we don't know the background, we still have some understanding of where it is it's heading. And again, the more sophisticated your audience is, the more sophisticated and the more detail that you're going to spend on this particular slide. Oh, I just want to mention too on this slide, if you notice on the, there's a figure in the back or a graphic in the back, some people refer to this as a foundation figure. So foundation figures are figures that would represent your work in a very generalized sense. And foundation figures are really good to have for your website, for your, your, your presentations as, a, as something that's sort of a unifying figure that represents you or your brand. Think of it as sort of the logo for science, right? the logo for your work. So if you can think about the foundation figure, sometimes that helps to tie together the work and you can use that as something that returns back again at the end of the presentation. Okay, so what about your acknowledgement slide? Um, your acknowledgement slide, you'll see in this one there's a photo and that's a really nice uh, professionally done photo. You don't want to have photos of people like swimming. You know, sometimes you see them you know, when they went whitewater rafting or they have some crazy game thing that they did or party. You don't want to have those types of photos. You really want to have the, the professional photo. You want to think about your, your collaborators, who they are, and you want to think about um, which are the most appropriate ones to include. And in this case, it's a very, very long um, a uh, very long sentence here for them. It's very hard to read. Think about bulleting. This really is a list. So if it's a list, this is one of the few chances that you get to do a really bulleted list. Um, in this case, it has the funding source. Usually funding sources um, are preferred in terms of disclosures to be put those on the front slides. So it's um, having this uh, the funding source here on the last slide really isn't recommended. And then uh, it didn't show it. I thought I'd put a, an example here of the bullets. I guess I didn't, I didn't bother. But you can imagine what bullets would look like in, the, in that section under the collaborators. And then disclosures, of course. The disclosures go at the front. And so the disclosures you'll see here, um, there are a couple things that you need to disclose, of course, depending on uh, what organization you're in or what you're trying to, to, to make the presentation for. You need to think about the three aspects of it. Of course, if you're receiving any sort of commercial money, you need to know if they, you conducted any sort of um, studies that were from supported by any outside organization, as well as if you're in the medical, right, if you're using any unlabeled drug use, that also has to be referenced um, with in the presentation, reference that you're going to do that during the presentation. This is a slide, a, a graph slide, and this is probably more for on the clinical side. If you're doing a presentation um, epidemiology, um, this is going to be a slide that looks quite familiar to you. Let's go through how we could adjust and change this slide using the rules that we've talked about already. So um, the first aspect of it is we see <laughs> results to characteristics. Well, which results, right? What is that headline title? What are the variables? We don't really have any definition of what those variables are. This is more like what you would see in the spreadsheet. And my favorite little nitpick here is that we have gender, but we don't <laughs> doesn't indicate which gender, whether it's male or female. Probably male because it's science, but in any case, it's not listed there. So you want to clarify and clearly annotate your um, labels there. And then we need to think about which data is the data and what precision is meaningful. So in terms of the precision being meaningful, in this case, um, what we're seeing here are the end groups are what's being highlighted with the percentages in the, in the, in the parenthesis, where in fact in reality from a, from a practical standpoint, really it's the percentages that we care about, about 34% did such and such, or about 29% did such and such. And notice I'm using the whole numbers even, 34% and 29% or 30%. It's, we don't need to have that point too. Yes, the precision may be important in terms of the calculation, but it's really not important in terms of in terms of delivering the meaning. And so you always need to be thinking about for this particular audience. Of course, you have to take into consideration who the audience is. For this particular audience, what is the precision that's meaningful to them? What's valuable to understand? Again, in terms of the overall meaning, what is it that you're trying to say about this information? And you also need to be thinking about the sequence. What order do you want to present this in? Sometimes there are elements within the chart, two elements that are related, and there are the things that turns out to be the important point. So you need to highlight and reorder whatever you're going to talk about so that you can get the audience to, to clearly make that connection between those elements. And so here's um, the before again, just with this, so you can see clearly. And then here's the after that we created. So here's the after we have, um, and um, we see the titling here, and then we see the uh, the graph. We've got the, the important elements that are highlighted in a different color. You can see it could have been highlighted in a different color, could have been made larger. It's also got the red box around it. It's done in a different order. We can see that the percentages are cleaned up to a single, single uh, with no, no decimals. We can see that the p-values, only the significant ones, are there. 
And so, and so um, you can see that we want to look at and only communicate the information that's the most important. Um, so again, to clarify and make it clear. So I was going to give you a quiz. I'm going to make this as homework. Um, you can download in the handouts. And a couple people have been asking about the handouts, by the way, where they are. Um, at the end, we're going to put up a link. And you'll be able to go to that link. And on the link, it'll have the handouts. And the handouts will include, in fact, I think, you know what? Armanda, did we forget to put the PDF? I think we forgot to, but we'll put it on there shortly. <laughs> Don't worry. By the time you get to it, we'll put the PDF on there for you. Um, but it includes not only that, it includes a couple of other links, um, things like I mentioned before, things to the survey, things to the redundancy principles if you want to learn more about that. And there's also links to how to be a great guest speaker and some additional information for you. So we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. I'll give you that link, give you some more information so you can quiz through that. This is the after, by the way. So you can see we cleaned it up pretty a lot. We took away the background. What did we do? We moved the marks. We changed the titling. And then we did the bottom piece. We moved it down. Much cleaner, I think, you can see on this one. Here's another one. Think about what you might change. I'll just give you a minute to think about this, or maybe less than a minute. <laughs> it can go quickly. And we changed it down. There's your quiz. And there's what we did to change it. And mostly we change the background, by the way, on this one because of the black logo. I, I'm not a real huge fan of the black. It depends on what it is for science, but it worked. It was good enough for this one. Of course, I changed the name. And then another one here for you to look at and a couple more. So all those are going to be left in there. Oops, let's go back. So what we see now is, oh, sorry about that. i got to switch my display. I just went out of it. Sorry about that. So what we see now um, in conclusion here is that we are at our minimum essential data. And I have a question here that came in. It says, can I repeat what I said about the placement of data graphs in regards to the left and right and the up and the down? Yes, I can, of course. So when you're creating data, right, data elements, if the graph has the same x and y axis, so you did um, a comparison chart. Maybe it was uh, you know, two similar items. When, they're, when the, the axes are the same, you want to make them left to right. So one would be on the left and one's going to be on the right so that when they compare, the axes still are the same. The x-axis is the same and the y-axis is the same. So they can easily make the comparison from left to right. If they're different, if what your x and y-axis are different, you're comparing something completely different, it's a different measurement, then the chart should be up and down, one at the top and one at the bottom. I hope that clarifies that. Okay, were there any other questions? No, no other questions in there. So um, if you've got questions, we're right at the top of the hour. We have, um, we're going to be wrapping up in just a few minutes. So I just wanted to talk about, um, before we get to the, the questions, I'm going to sort of summarize and then we'll get to the questions. So if you have any, go ahead and put those in the question box and then I will answer those when we get to the very, very, very end. But here we are. Um, I think that the most important thing to be thinking about here is our billboard design. Billboard design helps us to focus in on the things that are important, the things that are the most efficient for the slide. Things like the headline title, things like the takeaway, things like the circling of the graph, things to point to where it is that we need to look at on that particular graph. And that helps us go from mediocre to memorable just by following some simple rules. So I wanted to just say a couple things um, about an offer, which is going to go up on the screen right now. So oops, let's get that to memorable. There we go. We want to be memorable. So I want to talk about the, the offers that we have. I offer a course. It's called Expert Presenter. And if you click the link um, that's on your screen, is, this, is the link on the screen currently? Yep, the link is on the screen. So if you click the link on the screen, that's going to take you to, um, first of all, the handouts. And so it's got the free things that are above. And then below, you'll see there's two offers. One is about my expert presenter course. I offer an online course that you can take. There's a self-study course. It's about 30 hours of training. And 30 hours um, are spread over 49 days. It's self-study, so it's stripped to you on a, on a day basis. And so we give you enough time to go through the material, to um, understand and to practice. 
and then you're given um, unlimited amount of time after the entire content is stripped to you. So you'll start on day one, it goes out to day 49. Um, you can work on exercises and activities, and then at the end of it, if you want to go back and redo stuff, you can actually go back and redo some of the sections um, later if you want to go back, or just pick pieces of the other content that you're interested in. You can see the outline there. The outline goes through. Um, the course goes through not only the basics of presentation skills, which of course would include your delivery and the common mistakes of eye contact and how to use gestures appropriately and all the, the things associated with delivery. We also talk about the organization structures, what are the deductive and inductive structures and how do you think about those both from a presentational standpoint and from a cultural standpoint, what needs to be included, how do you design and organize a scientific presentation so that it follows uh, perhaps a storytelling arc. That's an interesting um, addition that's been coming out I don't know if you read the book, there's a guy who came out with a book recently, a scientist, a well-known scientist who came up with a story form of presentations, which I've actually been promoting for quite a while now. That's in there as well, and you can also see the slides. There's um, more information, more details, more examples of slides so that you can get an understanding. And again, this is, this is aimed at bioscience and biomedical professionals. And so typically the course is... Um, by itself, a self-study course. It's, it's typically sold for 250. Today's offer for the next two days, so Sunday at midnight, the offer goes away. It's $49 for the self-study course, and you need to use the coupon code SILVER, S-I-L-V-E-R, SILVER, in order to get it for the $49. If you'd like to add in some real-time coaching with that, three hours of live coaching, that would be group coaching, I would have um, a what's called hot seat person. Someone would come on, someone would, would do a delivery of a presentation, maybe via video, and that person would, um, would uh, have the opportunity to, to present, and then we would give some live feedback. And that would be three hours, three sessions that you held on Saturdays. You can see the dates there. And in case you can't make the dates, those would be done, um, those dates would be done in um, recorded, and you'd be able to see replays. And so that particular option, if you want to do the self-study plus the three hours of live training, that that is $149, um, again, till Sunday. So um, again, I also have a book. You can read more or look more about the book. I don't want to go into details. I've written a book, Smart Talk. It really is a, a Swiss Army life of communication skills from networking all the way through um, feedback and understanding how to have more charm and charisma. That's just more of a general book on on um, on communication skills. You can take a look at that as well. And there's also a deal and some bonuses along for that. But you can look at those yourself. They're on that page there. All right. I just want to answer um, a couple of more questions. And I said yes. I did. I did misspeak. <laughs> Um, somebody says that. Can I repeat what I said about clockwise to counterclockwise? I made a mistake, Sarah. Um, it should be presented in the way that that slide was, which I believe was uh, counterclockwise. It started and then went left down the bottom, then to the right and to the up, and then to the top. So your eyes are usually following in that direction. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that. Someone is asking, is the thank you slide necessary? No, you do not want a thank you slide. Um, typically speaking, if you have done your organization properly, and again, I have a whole workshop on, on organization and delivery, but if you've done it correctly, the audience will know that you've come to the end, and if you're in your question section, which sometimes that's when the people put up the thank you, I don't recommend that. I recommend instead to put your conclusions up, your main conclusions, during that Q&A period, and that's uh, more effective than having the thank you slide. If you verbally want to thank people at the very, 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 very end, that's okay. You can thank your audience for attending and for listening. That's a polite thing to do, but you certainly don't want to put that thank you up on the slide. Okay, so now we have another question that says, should taking images from the internet be avoided? How do you give credit without cluttering your slide? Okay, so taking internet images is a good question because it refers to the, the, the rules of copyright. And I'm very sensitive to that, of course, because all my work is copyrighted and I've seen much of my work lifted and used um, even in classes um, at organizations where people have taken my work and used it for classwork. So clearly, um, <laughs> this is a sensitive topic for me. Um, you do not, you're not able to take images uh, directly off the internet, but there are many, many, many sites available for 
um, either images that are free that you can use, that are legitimately used, that they're, that they're copyrighted for that, for, for public use. Um, there's one site that I like to use called pixabay.com, but that's generally for more general photos. It's probably not going to be for medical photos. Um, but within most of the academic institutions that I've been in, there's generally a department or generally an area within the institution that has a, a, an agreement or a license to use certain photos. They have sort of these photo databases. So you usually can get access to those photos. It's just a matter of finding the right person within your organization. A lot of people don't even know that that person exists. Um, so you can generally get photos that way. Um, you can also use photos, of course, you can do a Google search. There's an advanced image search. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but there's an advanced image Google search that you can put in the copyright designation. You can say, I want to find images that are for use, um, both um, for change, you can change it, and also for commercial use. Um, in your case, depending on who's listening, some people here are commercial, some people are academic. Um, so you can even put it in, the, the st most strict um, restriction would be for commercial use. You can put that in and then it'll return results back. You just need to be careful because sometimes those results, I'd say they're 99% accurate, but sometimes there is um, an error in that. So you just want to make sure it really is um, for that particular uh, use, that you've got the correct use. There's also something called Creative Commons. Um, Creative Commons, um, share and share alike. That's something that's a newer type of copyright system that's being created, that's been created. And if you can find that something is in that Creative Commons and it's a share and share alike, then you're free to use that particular image. And then there's also, of course, stock photos that you can, you can purchase. Um, I just switched after, oh, probably after 15 years of using the same service because the service just kept getting more and more and more and more expensive. I couldn't afford it anymore. I had to switch to a new service. And my new service now is about a dollar a photo, which is what I started out with years ago. The other service get it got up to, to between thirty and three hundred dollars a photo. So um, yes, you want to make sure you use them. You want to make sure you have the rights to use them. Now you also said, how do you give credit without cluttering the photo, the slide? Um, you can give credit very small print as long as it's on the slide. And in fact, um, if you look at some of the rules, it just has to be within the presentation itself. So you can even technically put it within the notes section. I don't think that's as um, fair, but it is, again, depends on who you're using the photo from. Um, and again, depends on what the rights are. Generally speaking, though, you can just put the photo rights if you need to put the photo rights. If you notice in all of mine, I do not use the photo rights because I pay for all of mine. I either pay or I use the services that, you know, that are ones that are available without. Okay, so now the next question is, what is, the, what is the verbal transition, and this is the last question that I'll respond to, what is the verbal transition and how is it different from an assertion that's in the question form? So that's a huge question, Jamie, <laughs> but, but Jamie, there, is, there are um, several forms of, of, of transition. Uh, the, the most common one might be a review preview. So a review preview means that you might go back and review, particularly when, you're, when you do basic science, a lot of times you use this review preview. You might say, well, what we just looked at, we saw that this connection, and then we saw this conclusion, and then we saw this conclusion, and each of those three points basically are the conclusions from the previous three slides. And then you'll say, well, and we thought about how they were related, and we thought about the connection between them, so our next thing, our next question was to look at blah, 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 blah. So you're right in the sense that the assertion in the form of a question could be that transition, but often there's more more sophisticated, uh, more sophisticated transitions than just the question that you asked. And they're really the the transition that you want to avoid, the thing you don't want to do, which is what you typically see in a lot of science presentations, is is something like this. And now we looked at this. And this next slide, we looked at this, and, and it's just like click, and the person kind of looks at it and remembers what it is that they're going to talk about. Oh, and on this, was, you know, this is what we did here, click. This is what we did here, and there is no transition. There is no tie between the elements, and that's really the thing that you want to avoid, of course. But I think your question was more about the sophisticated things. Again, those are covered. The different forms of transition are covered in my course, as well as the, the presentations that I deliver on site on campuses. So depending, I don't know, Jamie, you didn't say where you were from. So um, I am, I, uh, University of Pennsylvania, there's a lot of people on this call that are from University of Pennsylvania. I regularly go come on campus to University of Pennsylvania for both faculty and for postdocs. I happen to live in the area, so it's very convenient for them. So they bring me in several times a year to do programs. In fact, this program will be delivered again. The more detailed program will be delivered again shortly. Um, but there are... Um, 
um, for the other people who are, are on here that um, are potentially new clients or clients that I haven't come out to recently, um, always you can you can always ask them to come. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of teasing, but also that would be helpful. But you can ask your your uh, your development person to, to have me come out and do a program or your training department to have me come out and do a live program to give you the more details again in the short period of time it's hard to go through that. So I think that we are um, over our time clearly nine minutes so I hope that for those are, that have hung on to the call I appreciate your attendance, I appreciate you listening and again if you're interested in my programs you can see the details there we have um, we have the expert presenter course, which again is delivered over the 49-day period. Um, it's a very detailed course that really goes through step by step the deals of or the aspects of presentation. There's a self self study option, and then there's also the uh, gold option, which you're going to have to use the code gold, the, the promo code gold, in order to get that. Um, in order to get that, these offers are only good for the next. Uh, 48 hours. The offer will expire on Sunday, Sunday at midnight, Sunday the 11th, January 11th, as well as um, for those of, of your colleagues, maybe that you've got colleagues. I know a lot of people here from from similar institutions. A lot of people from MD Anderson. A lot of people from Ohio State. So um, if you're from those organizations and you've got a colleague that you'd like to see this, there's going to be a replay. Um, so there'll be a replay in, um, it'll be up shortly, probably within an hour or so, and that replay will be available for 24 hours. And I just wanted to mention too that you, um, by signing up, you're now on my list, um, so you will be receiving, I, I don't blast people, I don't, I'm really very sensitive to that, you only get something once a week and it's just sort of a summary and it tells you the things that I'm doing both on my public speaker podcast and my smart talk podcast. These are podcasts that are focused on communication, leadership and management. So you're getting that. So in order to use the codes, again, we have the silver code. It's S-I-L-V-R, silver. And for the, uh, for the, the code for the, the gold is gold, G-O-L-D. How tricky, right? And the, again, the normal price for these is $250 for, the, for just for the self-study course alone. So the $49 is really a great deal. Um, Again, I'm not trying to push you into it. I'm just telling you it really is a good deal. And if you're interested, um, you can see the details there. I'd love to have you sign up. I'd love to have you participate and learn more. So I'm going to wrap that up. We're right here. So thank you so much for attending. I really sincerely appreciate um, you attending, and I hope that you have learned. And again, I would love to have feedback. So if you want to send me feedback about your experience, you can always reach me at lisa at lisabmarshall.com. That's lisa at LisaBMarshall.com, and if you're social media savvy, it would be great if you could tweet or promote. Um, some people I know in sciences aren't really into that, but if you are, if you happen to be, that would be great too, just to let your colleagues know. Thanks so much again, and that's it. We'll be signing off.